Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Our top story this morning, a senior Conservative MP has defected from the Leave campaign to join the Remain camp. And an influential businessman has come out in favour of a Brexit. With two weeks to go now until the once-in-a-generation referendum on EU membership, both campaigns are intensifying. Sarah Williston, a GP and Conservative member for Totnes, says she was forced to switch sides because of misleading claims from the Leave campaign about NHS spending. Well, let's go to our political guru, Norman Smith in Northern Ireland. Uh, Norman, how significant is Sarah Williston's defection? Well, Joanna, she may not be a household name, but she does matter because she's not your typical Tory. She's not someone who's identified as being part of one Tory tribe. And so when she announced a couple of months ago that she was throwing in her lot with the Brexiteers, they all went, yay, because, you know, she was not one of the usual suspects. She was a different sort of Tory, regarded as sort of independent, free-thinking. I mean, I remember when I first um, met her when she was thinking about becoming a Tory MP. She was um, in her local GP surgery in some small village in Devon. And the reason she was getting into politics was not because of the Tory party or Conservative policies. It was because she was worried about alcohol abuse. So she's a very different sort of Tory and seen as sort of a bit of a, a weather vane, I guess. But she now feels, even though you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think she was saying, yes, she agreed that there were issues around immigration, around the cost of being part of the EU. She didn't like Project Fear. I mean, she pretty much signed on the dotted line for the Brexit camp. She now feels that the way they have presented their argument and saying, we hand over 350 million quid to the EU is unacceptable because we know that figure has been widely challenged and contested by the Treasury Select Committee, by uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, by the National Statistics Authority. And she now says, look, if I can't hand out their leaflet saying we're paying 350 million quid, then can I really honestly campaign for them? So she has, on that basis, decided to switch camps. have to say, a lot in the Brexit camps are saying, uh, what is going on? You disagree with our PR strategy when only a couple of weeks ago you agreed with us overall. This is all very odd. But her move does matter because it just maybe sends out a signal that perhaps some independent-minded MPs are beginning to think more towards the Remain camp. Well, we can talk now to Dr Sarah Williston, the Conservative MP, who has switched sides. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Why? I think because of listening to all the arguments during the course of campaign and also because I chair the health committee a lot of people have been asking me um, whether the NHS will be better off or worse off if we remain or leave the EU and I, I've really come to feel very strongly that we're better off staying within the EU and I think the trigger I think a lot of people perhaps watching this will have received their postal vote and found themselves actually staying their hand and thinking really what's it going to feel like on the 24th of June if I wake up and we've actually voted to leave and I, and I realized in my case that would not be a sense of freedom um, or liberation it would actually be a sense that we'd lost something so I think it was important to be honest about that decision and uh, and and explain why you don't like that 350 million pound figure that has been touted by the leave campaign an extra 350 million pounds weekly for the NHS. It's simply what? not true. That's the thing. And I've been telling Vote Leave this from the start. That's why I've not been really campaigning so with them on So when did you first platforms. say um, that that right was not true? Right from the very beginning, I've said to them that they should describe it as a gross figure, um, that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be implying that there'd be an extra 350 million a week, particularly to go to the NHS, if we voted to leave, because it doesn't take account of the rebate, and it doesn't take account of the money that flows back from Europe in the other direction. And as somebody who's campaigned ever since I arrived in Parliament for, for honesty about data in public life, I, I couldn't have handed out one of their leaflets or stepped on board a battle bus which had a knowingly misleading figure right at the heart of its campaign. And, and I think the public deserve better, frankly, from both sides. So has that been a dishonest campaign? Well, I think the, the trouble is that there's sometimes an attitude that the ends justify the means and that somehow some people feel that it gets people talking about the figure and it is a big figure even if you use the true net figure. Um, but my view is that the public deserve better. The public deserve to hear an honest 
articulation of what the figures are and, and are that's the remain not been camp there. any better though because you're now plumping exactly. with that side no, i think both sides as i say i've written about this for for weeks i think the public deserve better information and that's been the the, the greatest single call to me when when i've been um, speaking to constituents is they just feel they don't know who to believe and they wanted to have um, honest open data and i don't think they've had enough of that i'm afraid so how would you describe then this campaign this vote that we're being told is the most important vote in a generation and you're saying people are being told to make up their minds on the basis yeah. of flawed evidence on both sides. Well, indeed, and on my website, what I've done is I've put links to things like the House of Commons Library, BBC Fact Checker, Full Fact. Those are the sources where people can find balanced background information. And of course, it's not just about information, it's a hearts and minds debate, this as well. Um, and as I talk to people, people have a variety of different things that are pulling them but as the campaign crystallizes it seems to me into an argument about economy and immigration I think the tone of some of the commentary around immigration has been very upsetting and in fact one thing that has really upset me is the number of my constituents who are from the EU who have been telling me how it feels to be on the receiving end of some of that commentary if, if you're and I think saying it's, it's, really upsetting. it's effectively been a flawed debate then on mm. that basis what do we take from whatever the result exactly. is? Exactly. Well, I think that the difficulty is that people wanted better quality information and they should have had it right from the start. What politicians' job is to, is to be honest about the data and clear about the data, but then also to respect the result. And, and I'd like to see politicians now come but you, together I mean, you're, you're to promise they'll respect the result. Yeah. It's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're a politician. Yes. At this late stage, you're coming out and sort of clearly putting this out there. What Did you not have a duty to do this? I have sooner? been saying it for weeks. Um, I've been writing about but this for a long time. But you didn't have this time. platform before because you didn't actively come out and, and say what you're saying now. Actually, what, what do you think? There are many factors leading people to make this decision. And, and I think like a lot of people, um, I, I do feel that the EU is an imperfect institution, that there, are, there were many things about the negotiation that, that really disappointed me. And there are important issues to do with sovereignty. But as the campaign has gone on and you listen to the weight of evidence, I have to ask myself, and particularly as I say, as a, as a doctor and someone who chairs the committee, is our health and our healthcare system and the NHS going to be better off or worse off um, if we leave and I believe we'll be worse off outside the EU. Um, David has tweeted we should respect all views even if they change at the 11th hour. Cameron has done it. Mm -hmm. uh, tweet from Fletch, glad she's gone, she's an MP and this will move this move will get her kicked out at the next election. Mm -hmm. uh, Gavin has tweeted she was never for out, this has cabinet position promise written all over it, planned damage control from Cameron. Have you been lobbied by the Remain no, side? No, it, it, you know, to be honest, absolutely not. I think that uh, I, I explained my position to colleagues on both sides over the last couple of days, and certainly it's absolutely to, not true that I've been offered side. a post. I've neither sought a post nor nor uh, been offered one, so I think that that's completely untrue. Um, I've spoken to people on both sides. I've listened to the views of my constituents, and of course, remember, I'm only one vote out of many, many millions. I think that the But you're now a big prize for the Remain camp. Aren't you? Oh, Would well, you campaign alongside David Cameron potentially? I think once you make a decision, that it's right that you explain that. But I haven't, as I say, been taking a prominent role in campaigning for either of the camps, and and uh, you know because I think that what I'd like to see is is much clearer evidence presented to people to help them make up their minds. And then the job of politicians, as I say, is to make sure that whatever the British people decide, we work together constructively to make that happen. That's our key role in this. Have you spoken to David Cameron at all about this? I have. This? I think it's a courtesy, and I've spoken to Michael Gove. I've, I've told uh, my colleagues and my senior colleagues that I've decided to change my mind and why. When, when did you speak to David Cameron? I spoke to David Cameron um, on uh, the day before yesterday to let him know that I was going to change and I spoke to Michael Gove yesterday. And what did they so, say to you? Well, I think those are private conversations and was, private conversations of, should be private. But, uh, but certainly there's no question and I, I'd be absolutely clear with me that I've neither sought nor been offered any post that would be hugely disrespectful to, to people to, to have any, any, anything that, that could imply that. I, I think that actually being a select committee chair is one of the best jobs in politics. Was, was David Cameron pleased though to hear from you? Well, I think of course those who are you know, campaigning, everyone campaigning for Remain is, is pleased if somebody joins them. And of course people 
are critical of politicians when they change their mind, but I'd ask a simple question that I think people are also fed up with politicians who are incapable of changing their minds and, and don't listen to the arguments. But don't people have the right to expect their politicians, before we get to the, mm. this, the end stages of mm. a campaign, which is as important as this one, mm. to have listened to all the facts, yeah. to have weighed them up much sooner, and to be able to trust everything that they this hear is, from the politicians at every stage. This is an immensely so, complex decision. And, um, and as I say, for me... It, but the, if you couldn't make up your, I might, think make up your mind to this stage, what hope this, is there for anyone yes, out there? Well, I think, to be honest, I think a lot of people watching this will find that they're in the same position. A, very, very many people have said to me, I've got my postal vote, I don't know which cross which box to make my cross in and a lot of people telling me that they'll be walking into the the polling booth still uncertain about which way to go and so my plea is that from both camps is that we have clear honest data available to people to help them make up their mind do you think they've got it now I'm afraid they don't from the either of the official campaigns. So I would look at, say, at sites like the House of Commons Library, BBC Why Fact Checker, and Full Fact. Voters to have Absolutely, to that? I agree with will you. People and this do is that? what I've been saying for weeks. I hope they will. But ultimately, there's but not But if they don't, the you're saying people are making up their minds mm. on false information. I think that they deserve better from both official campaigns. Is the best way to put it. But you're saying they're not getting there it. <laughs> But they, there are other sites they can get it. But as I say, it's not just about the factual information. It's a hearts and minds decision, this, isn't it? It's a very difficult decision. And I think it's right that people take it very seriously. And many other people will have found that they started in one place and then having listened to all the arguments, they find they're in a different position at the end of it. And, and I think that's what democracy is about, that we have a, a really important national debate. But one, one thing I would say is that if we do vote to remain, what we have to do is reset our relationship with, uh, with Brussels because th well, there's what been hope a profound is there of that disconnect. Once well, the vote's been had. No, but what I would say is that in the way we connect with our European politicians, when I started this process, I used to go to public meetings and nobody could name a single MEP, um, certainly not their own local MEPs. They've can, never can written they now to them. is the question. And but I think it's, people are now thinking about the EU and I think okay. what we need to do is start, if we remain, engage with it. Will other MPs do what you've done? Um, I'm sure there are other MPs Have out you there thinking. To any? Of course, but it's for them to make their decision, How many? and not for me to make it or say what that is. So, I, no, well, I think it's for them to think about it. But, but as would I say, you say you've spoken to many MPs who are now thinking that actually their public position doesn't reflect their private? Position? I mean, there are still MPs I know who are going to actually publicly state their position in the next few days. Um, but it's Changing for them. It. Um, I think it's for them to, to actually make their points rather than for me to say it on their behalf. It sounds stage managed when you no, put it's it like not, that. No, it's not stage managed at all. In fact, I think that many of my colleagues were very surprised. Um, and, and for me, I think another trigger for me is that my, my father's just had a, a, a triple bypass. He's, he's 81. He um, started work and training as a mine clearance diver after the war while he was still a teenager. For him, the idea that we could ha have conflict in Europe isn't just an abstract con concept. He was pleading with me all the way up to the operating theatre doors to change my mind. And I think a lot of us do take very seriously the views of our families and our colleagues. I mean, my entire team, both in London and in the constituency, are voting to remain. My son, who's a scientist, is voting to remain. All of these views and the views of your constituents they build up over a campaign and I think that if you're not prepared to sometimes say actually I'm in a different place now then you shouldn't be doing the job in my view as a politician. Sarah Wollaston, thank, thank you. you very much for joining us.